Jesus showed up to the scene and the first time he came to the synagogue during his earthly ministry, he opened up the scroll to Isaiah and he said, my job description, the first thing you gotta understand about what I came to do is I came to set the captives free. Amen, yes. And so I believe there's a, according to the word that Miss Jackie just shared, there's a special grace to set the captives free here today, a special grace for forgiveness today over you guys so apprehended by faith. We are transitioning to the portion of worship where we give out of our overflow. So as you feel led, if you feel led, you have an opportunity to do that now. We give not to be blessed, we give because we are already blessed is what we do because we are in this covenant of grace. I don't know, yes, thank you. <laughs> I wasn't sure who had, the, who had the offering, but beautiful thing. So I'm gonna pray for that. As I pray for that, you could start opening your Bibles to Luke chapter 24 around verse 13 is where we will start. But let's pray, Father, I pray and I know that the spirit of wisdom and revelation rests in this room in the knowledge of you the spirit that enlightens the eyes of our hearts so we know the hope of our calling and we know the greatness of your power toward us who believe in the inheritance that lies within us. And so based on the blessing that we already blessed in the spiritual heavenly places, we now give out of that reality, Father. We give what's already yours, already yours. And this is our little bitty way of just saying thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are and what you did and for your ever-present presence with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Like I said, we'll be in Luke chapter 24, verse 13 is where we will be. Luke chapter 24, verse 13. I do want to uh, point out my two guests of honor sitting in the front, <laughs> Mr. Rodney and Mr. Chris. Yeah, all right, give, it, give it up for those guys. Be sure to shake their hand and hug their necks. And Chris waited for me to start preaching, said, I'm out of here. <laughs> he hears me most, uh, most Sunday nights. Uh, anyways, so. Nothing new for him, but thank you guys for being willing to come. The um, Luke chapter 24, verse 13, we're talking about a post-resurrection Jesus today and what that means for us and what it means for two of them is what the translation says. We always assume it's two men, but we don't know that. We know one of them is a man and one of them is unnamed, so it could be. Oh, actually, a woman could be the other one or a married couple of some sort. What's interesting about how Jesus, after Easter, last Sunday, reveals himself is that it was to women first, which was shocking to the culture of the day. Second-class citizens is what women were, and you couldn't even use their testimony in the court of law. Why would God choose, under the Greek or the Roman law, why would God choose women to be the one he confirms his most amazing sign and wonder to the testimony of women, and then they went and told the disciples or apostles what had happened at that empty tomb. And of course, the disciples didn't believe them, which was common in that day. You don't believe the testimony of a woman. Amazing God lifts the dignity of women, or what would have been the least of these, and he gives them the kingdom first. And he does that with these two on the road to Emmaus, too. We got one name. We don't have the name of the other, but these are not famous as far as we know. He doesn't go to the Roman Caesar first. He doesn't go to the high priest, high priest first, guys. He doesn't go to the synagogue he does, again. He doesn't go to the temple again. Look at the way Jesus reveals himself after his resurrection. He reveals himself in a garden, as a gardener almost. <laughs> he reveals himself in transition, as these guys are walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus on the way, he reveals himself at breakfast to the disciples on a beach. 
He reveals himself in a dinner in the upper room. Guys, I want you to see this. Jesus is hinting at some things now that we have to see. And one of the things is this. You're not only going to feel my presence in the synagogue and the temple. I am with you now as you transition, as you go to the beach, as you eat dinner, as you gather around the table, I am with you and I never leave you, ever. And religion wants to put up some boundaries to that revelation. And Jesus is one of the walls he tore down. There is no veil there anymore or in any area of your life. I am with you. And so he reveals himself even to second-class citizens, Mary of Bethany, one of the very first, the religious professionals miss it. The religious leadership miss it. And those that are kind of the underbelly of society joyfully receive it. This Jesus. And so we find these people on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24, 13, says this, that very day, two of them were going to the village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened, what had happened, all these things the past three or four, or the past week, what we call Passion Week, all these things, Jesus triumphantly coming in, Jesus teaching and calling out the religious leaders, Jesus preaching on the Mount of Olives. Jesus, of course, Good Friday, being arrested and dying a criminal's death in the worst way possible. And then now, even Jesus, it seems to them, maybe even raising from the dead. Well, this is so beautiful. Verse 15, while they were talking about all these things and discussing it together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Jesus is kind of sneaky here. He just kind of like, you ever like turn around and say, what, where did you come from? You know what? <laughs> They're talking, two dudes talking, and pretty soon, or, or, or two, two people talking, now it's three walking and talking. And actually, he's not even talking. Jesus is just listening. Now, here's the, here's the mystery of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was always there. He just manifests himself as he sees fit. But he was listening the whole way, whether they saw it or not. Interestingly, the word Emmaus, guys, that town they're going to, the Hebrew root word is burning place, which is interesting. Let's put that in the back pocket as the story progresses. These are regular folks. Like Paul said, not many of you are wise, according to the flesh. Not many of you are powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth, Paul said, but he did all, took all those things to shame the way the world does stuff and so that the power of Christ would be multiplied and glorified, not man. 1 Corinthians 1, or as Acts 4 says, these are just uneducated, ordinary men that are turning the world upside down, the religious leaders see, but they saw that they had been with Jesus. The mark of your life is that it had been with Jesus, then it doesn't matter your education or your birth or your strength or what people think of you. And so they speak of Jesus. I think this is a pattern in Scripture. They're speaking about Jesus, and Jesus delights to show up. One of the things that grieves me a little bit is how little Christians speak about Jesus. Sit around a table, sit around a conversation, and typically we talk about other people. Or typically we talk about world events. Or typically we talk about politics. Or typically we, t- we got all these, or typically we talk about what we saw on the news. Whatever. And I'm, none of those are bad, first of all. I don't judge anyone for talking about those things. But, but two Christians get together, and when their focus is on Christ, he shows up. We have so many distractions that keep us from experiencing his ever-present presence. Talk of him, and you'll soon walk with him. Turn your attention to Jesus. It's an invitation for him to show up. And so this isn't a sermon as we talk about him collectively right here, guys. This is the invitation for Jesus to manifest himself. 
This is an invitation for Jesus to show up in our midst as we lift him up, turn our attention to him, and talk of him together. He shows up. That's his promise. That's his pattern. He, the God who dwells amongst his people. And so Jesus asked a question. Uh, it says, well, verse 16, he's incognito, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And I don't know if that was because of Jesus or because of them. I, I have a sneaking suspicion is that they weren't really looking for him. They were expecting to talk about him. They weren't expecting to experience him or encounter him. And sometimes we can go to church and expect to talk about him and hear about him, but not necessarily encounter him or experience him. And he doesn't want to just be talked about. He wants to be fellowshipped and experienced. That's who God is. He is relational. From the beginning in the garden, he was relational, and he made us in that image to be relational with him. We are actually created and fine-tuned to experience God because we're made in his image. And we've been told elsewhere, we're, told we're a worm or we're just sinners. or No, you have been created and meticulously made in the womb of your mother and called and chosen before the foundation of the world to commune and fellowship with this Jesus. And that's what's happening here. In verse 17, Jesus asked a question. I love that he asks questions that he knows answers to, but that's what good teachers do. What is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? I like, it's almost you see some of the playfulness of God here, I think. He's asking questions he knows about. He's coming in incognito. I wonder if Jesus has a little smirk on his face as he's walking with these guys. Because he's like, you're about to get your mind blown. You don't even know. And I wonder if he has a little smirk on your face as he's walking with you as we're ignorant of his presence that's right in front of our face all day, every day. And he says, just a matter of time that you're about to get your mind blown with my presence as your awareness becomes more fine-tuned. And so Jesus asks questions that he gets, he knows the answer to. And that's not because he needs to know any information. It's because he wants us to reveal our heart and we get to know what's in us as we respond. That's part of the relationship. And so these people are a little downcast because look at what they say, Cleopas, what a terrible name in my opinion. Verse 18, I was thinking of naming our youngest that for a while there, but we chose not to. <laughs> then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And I love this. This guy unpacks his teaching about Jesus to Jesus. He asks a question, don't you know about what happened to Jesus? To Jesus. <laughs> and then, so what does Jesus say? Verse 19, and he said to them, what things? He plays ignorant, right? Right? What things? He wants to keep drawing it out of them. Keep drawing the wound we're going to see out of them. Keep drawing the disappointment out of them. Bring it to the surface, what's happening here. That's some of the things, because he sees it already, guys. He knows what you need already. But there's some things that you don't even know that you need to bring to the surface. Like Miss Jackie said, oh, I, I forgave, I forgave, I forgave. Boom. Well, I guess I didn't. And so he, he, because he loves us, he puts us in situations, puts us in circumstances to draw that out because the wound can't be healed if we don't even acknowledge that it's there many times. And so he draws it out. What happened, guys? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, verse 20, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. Verse 21, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. There it is. We had hoped. I want you to think of that. We had hoped. There's the wound. Yes, and besides all of this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Amen. Verse 24, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. They had the facts down of Jesus, the basic facts. 
But knowing him in a relational way is not knowing a doctrinal statement about him or having your theological ducks in a row. There is a relational way to know him. And that's what Jesus is going to start drawing these guys into. They needed a revelation of Jesus, just not more information about what happened. And a revelation of Jesus happens to you and to your heart, not just facts on a sheet. He wants to come and live inside, we see. We had hoped, they said, and it was hope deferred. They wanted a political Messiah. They thought he was going to redeem Israel in such a way that would immediately overthrow Rome, their subjectors, and set up the the Daniel revelation of the Son of Man immediately, the way they thought it should happen. In other words, God didn't do it the way I thought he should have done it. How many times do we say that or think that even if we don't say it, if we're honest? And this is what's amazing about this. The hope that they were seeking was standing in front of them. And many times the hope that you're seeking is standing in front of you. The very presence of the Holy Spirit and Jesus himself is always there and has never once left you. There is discouragement there in them. Anxiety was setting in because it's not going how we thought or planned it to go. And there's a theme of death, burial, and resurrection, obviously in Scripture and in the gospel story. It is the gospel of Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And the amazing thing is we find is that it is our death and our burial and our resurrection too. He is our head. He is the last Adam. And just as he died, we died. I have been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20, and it is no longer I who lived, but Christ Jesus who lives in me. His resurrection is my resurrection. And the life I now live, I live by faith of the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. This is even his faith that he gives us. Jesus There's themes of his life, and because there's themes of his life, Christ's life, there's themes of our life. Sometimes we have to put to death the things that didn't go as we thought they should go. The relationship, the tragedy, the way I had it planned in my mind, I'd be further along by now, I thought. And you had to put to death those thoughts of how you thought it should go in order for them to resurrect of how he wants them to go. It's the same for us. New life, new life. Sometimes we miss his presence the whole time wondering why it's not going like we thought it should go. And he's right there. His leadership is perfect, and his presence is the answer to our questions. Jesus His presence is the cure to our problems. When you were little, if you can think of this, and you were running or you're on your bike for the first time and you fell and you scraped your knee really bad, skint your knee, or on your skateboard for the first time, as (laughs) as my son was yesterday, and you scrape your knee really bad, ugly gash, blood everywhere, you typically go to run to who first? Well, either depending on who is more graceful, a mom or a dad. But let's say you run to your mom because she's really good at those things. And what does your mom do? Does she instantly heal it? No. But she'll blow on it. And she'll love you. And she'll comfort you. And all of a sudden, it's better. You stop crying. Not because there's no scar or there's no wound, but because her presence is there. And the things you think you need are really his presence. And the scar and the wound is going to be a testimony, but his presence is more needful than anything else that we think we need. And so he brings his presence to these men who are disappointed or this couple that's disappointed, and he leans into them. 
and he embraces them with his presence, even though they're not even aware of it. He's doing that now, guys. In all those areas in your past, he was there. In all those areas of your past, he walked with you. In all those areas of your past, he spoke to you. And so even here, what happens, he says, look at you guys, verse 25, oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all the things that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ would suffer these things and enter into his glory? Look at verse 27. This is big for me, verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning who? Himself. He said, here, guys, let me give you a little motivational poster. Let me give you a little piece of advice. Let me give you a little, no. He gives them himself. The revelation of Jesus is that in John 1.1, 1, 1, he is the living word of God uppercase. And he delights to reveal himself through the word of God, lowercase. This is the lowercase word of God. And that we can encounter him, the living word of God, through his word of God. And so he opens up. Now, this is amazing to me. All the prophets. I don't know if you've read all the prophets. Some of them are pretty difficult. But what Jesus is saying is that now you have to put on a lens of my new covenant, Jesus, when you read Moses, you got to put a lens of Jesus when you read the prophets, and he adds to it later on the Psalms, the whole Old Testament. Because if we don't put on the lens of Christ and his finished work on the cross for us, then we will go back to the Old Testament and start drumming up legalism and try harder religion. And it'll be about me trying harder and doing stuff more, and giving more, and trying to fast harder than everyone else, and trying to do sacrifice more. And if I don't see it through the lens of the perfect sacrifice of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, and that my death was his death, and my resurrection was his resurrection, and Ephesians goes in even further and says, his enthronement is my enthronement because I am with him and in him, then everything is good news. You can go back to Leviticus and see the good news because it's a treasure hunt to find Jesus everywhere. Jesus is opening that revelation up to us. This book is not about behavior modification. You need to hear that. Because if it is, then we are failures in that regard. And everyone else is, including especially Israel. <laughs> But this book is about the living, breathing, moving grace of God toward you in Christ that picks you up out of the pit and not just walks with you, but in you and through you. And that is good news. All the prophets and all the scriptures reveal him. Jesus expounds himself. What a beautiful Bible study that would be, right? Right? He's just going through it. And these guys are like, man, this guy really knows his, man, he really knows his stuff. Well, yeah, he wrote it through the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the living word unpacks the word. And Jesus doesn't give them a pep talk. Here's the thing. Jesus right then could say, hey, you want to know more about Jesus? How about a miracle? You talked about miracles. I'll give you one. Here's the revelation. Sometimes, a lot of times, it's not the miracle that we think we need. The miracle is his presence that shows up and that breathes life into you as you open this up and seek to encounter him. That is a living, breathing, 24-7 miracle. His presence, his resurrected spirit now is with you and for you and in you and through you 24-7. And we're still looking for a, the sign of Jonah or not the sign of Jonah. We're looking for a different sign. And Jesus says, I'll give you the sign of Jonah. A man's going to be buried and then brought to life three days later. And he says, that's the sign. Me. I'm the miracle. Jesus is the miracle. 
And so he reveals to these things. And he says that to the teachers early in his ministry, John 5, you look for these things in Scripture because you think that in Scripture you have eternal life. In other words, you think in Scripture you're going to find the keys to eternal life. He says, here's the thing. All these Scripture testify of me, Jesus. You're not looking for a key. You're not looking for a principle. you got to look for me because I have eternal life. I am eternal life. It's about a person. It's about a revelation of Jesus. It's about encountering Jesus. It's about putting on the lens of Jesus. The written word is for encountering the living word, and we could do it everywhere. I'll go a quick overflow to see you from Genesis all the way to uh, close to the Gospels. The seed of the woman in Genesis whose heel was bruised but yet crushed the serpent's head was Jesus. He's the one who did that. The blessing of Abraham to all the nations is Jesus. The high priest after the order of Melchizedek is Jesus. The man who wrestled with Jacob was Jesus. The lion of the tribe of Judah is Jesus. The voice from the burning bush is Jesus. The Passover lamb is Jesus. The prophet greater than Moses is Jesus. The captain of the Lord's army to Joshua is Jesus. The ultimate kinsman redeemer mentioned in Ruth is Jesus. The son of David who was a king greater than David is Jesus. The suffering savior of Psalm 22 is Jesus. The good shepherd of Psalm 23 is Jesus. The wisdom of Proverbs is Jesus. The lover of the Song of Solomon is Jesus. The Savior described in the prophets and the suffering servant of Isaiah is Jesus. The princely Messiah and son of man of Daniel who establishes a kingdom without end is Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus. And what all, he's all that And look at how gentle he is with these two men. Look at verse 28. So as they drew near to the village to which they were going, look what Jesus does here. He acted as if he was going further. And so he's, they still don't know how a clue who he is. But they know this. This man's got to stay with us. And how good is Jesus that even in their ignorance, he responds to their hunger and thirst. And even in your ignorance, he responds to your hunger and thirst because they constrain him. He wasn't going to force his company on them, but he was going to draw out their hunger and thirst because that's relationship. It's a very strong word. They constrained him. It's akin to the one Jesus used when he said the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. They didn't just invite him in, but they held him. They grasped his hand. They tugged at his robe. They said, no, 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 you should not go. There's an audacious thirst that they had. And they didn't even know this man was Jesus. They hold on to him like Mary Magdalene did at the tomb. So much so, as she clings to his feet, he says, you can't hold me, Mary, because I got to go. Because the revelation is as I go and as I ascend and as I'm enthroned, you're not going to have to just cling to my feet because I'm going to come live inside of you. Are we okay with a little Bible study and a nice meeting once a week. We get as much of Jesus as we want. We get as much of Jesus as we hunger and thirst for. Amazingly, look what happens here. and They urge him and he stays. He goes in to stay with them. They still don't know who he is. When he was at the table with them, the table, guys, the table is the new covenant altar. Your kitchen table can be an altar. So much happened at the table in Jesus' ministry, including his own anointing by Mary. 
When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and he blessed and broke it and he gave it to them. That sounds very similar to something, a couple things actually. Sounds like the feeding of the 5,000, but it also sounds like the last thing he did with the disciples before his death. Communion, right? And so Jesus, a revelation of communion, I believe he's even giving here. And their eyes were open, verse 31. And they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. The dinner table is a holy place. He's restoring that in the church. He makes a table. He makes a breakfast table for the disciples, remember, as he called Peter back into the fold. He says, I'm knocking at the door of your heart because I want to come and sit with you at the table. This has always been about fellowship. This has always been about intimacy, and this has always been about communion from the very beginning. That is what was in his heart because that, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had that. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God, has always had love, had always, has always had fellowship, and has always had communion. And out of the overflow of their relationship, they make man in their own image so that we can also be absorbed into that love, into that fellowship, into that communion. That's what it means. And you are predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ because why? You were made in the image of Jesus Christ, your divine origin. You're predestined to be conformed to what you were made in. Before Adam fell and before you ever even thought about sin, he chose you in him before the foundation of the world. You were chosen and predestined in Christ before anything ever happened, before anything ever messed up, before anything was ever broken. And you're being restored to that same image. As it's being restored in you, it gets out of you. And it happens in your family. It happens in your community. It happens in your church. What happens as a result of this encounter with Jesus They had some clues. Look at this, verse 32. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he walked, talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? If you open the scriptures and don't do it through the lens of Jesus, you won't get a burning, other than heartburn, you won't get a burning heart because you're likely to only feel condemnation. But if you do it through the, the, the lens of Christ and his finished work, you're going to see the beauty of Jesus everywhere in their scriptures. Did not our hearts burn within us? He is releasing burning hearts from his presence that should no longer be restricted. It's not restricted. So Emmaus isn't the burning place. Remember, Emmaus means burning place. The burning place was them all along, not a city not a building, people. We're the burning place as Jesus is the center of that fire. Pentecostal fire, Pentecost, the burning flames, tongues of flames that were above them. That's Jesus. He's releasing the burning mind and the burning heart in Acts 2 on those people. This is Directly, because later on, directly, he opens the mind of the apostles in the book of Luke to get a revelation of himself in scriptures. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. We sang about it, Revelation 1, the man with the eyes of fire is Jesus. He releases that fire. I've come to bring fire on earth and how I wish it was always kindled. The one who's coming, John said, will baptize you with fire. And so for us with the burning hearts, it's the fire of perfect love, a consuming fire that consumes us in everything. It consumes everything we were never created to be. It consumes everything and every lie that sin said we were. Every lie that the enemy said we were. Because that's all he has is a lie anyway. And so that truth, that revelation burns it up. And so what had happened as a result of that burning, they rose the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the 11. And those who were with them gathered, saying, the Lord has risen indeed. And he's appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. As the team comes up, 
and close. Here's what I want you to see as far as life and your life in this. Because imagine this passage of Scripture to be a life with God. And I think in many ways it is. Because these men are by themselves at first. But are they? These men think they're by themselves and they're talking about religion. (laughs) But are they? And a man comes up alongside them. And they think they're still just talking about Jesus. But are they? And then at the very end of this thing, when they, of course, constrain him to come in and their hearts are burning and they find him at the table, their eyes are opened and they realize, wait a minute, all along, he's been with us. From the beginning, he's been with me. And the revelation is this, he has never on his end been separated from you. Never once. He's been walking with you. He's been carrying you. He's been teaching you through different life stages. He's been walking through different heartaches, disappointments, pains, traumas, tragedies. He's always been there. And what has to catch up is our awareness of him because he hasn't changed. He hasn't moved. He was there the whole time. Our life story is rich with his ever-present presence, just as these guys. There is no difference. And not just as a man who walks alongside us, but as a spirit who lives in us, a living flame of love in us. It doesn't get any more intimate or personal than that. And so we pray, Father, a revelation of your presence, a revelation of your flame, a revelation of your goodness, Jesus, with us from beginning, with us to the end, and with us in the in-between where we don't see nothing or feel nothing. You're still here, you're still with, you're still face to face, you're still in, you're still through, the whole way through. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.